guys welcome back to nyx reads thank you so much for watching please feel free to subscribe if you love watching bookish content and give this video a thumbs up if you love watching monthly reading wrap-ups crazy to think that it's already time for the january wrap-up i read six books in total as usual i'm gonna go through them from worst rated to best rated and stay tuned until the end to find out how much money i saved by using my library card I had such a good reading month, I'm pretty sure there's already two books that I'm going to talk about today that will make it to my best of the entire year list, so fingers crossed that the rest of the year is going to go just as well. First of all, I read an ARC that I received from Red Galley, ARC stands for Advanced Readers Copy. So this is Women of Good Fortune by Sophie Wan. This is a debut novel. The story is set against a high society Shanghai wedding which means that, and I've seen it in a few of the reviews already, I think everybody in some way is going to compare this to Crazy Rich Asians. I don't know if this is something that the author likes to hear or not. We have three main female leads, Lulu, Jane, and Rena, who are best friends. Lulu is about to enter a marriage and she's not excited about it because she mainly does it for the money to help out her family. So in the middle of the wedding planning, she expresses how unhappy she is to her two girlfriends and they decide to boycott the wedding by performing a heist. All three of them have their own reasons why they want to participate and want to take on that risk. So their plan is to steal all of the cash gifts that they will receive from these super high profile ultra rich guests and then GTFO basically. That premise sounded very, very exciting to me because it sounds like a lot of fun and also a lot of glamour because of the wedding setting. There was quite a few things in here that I really liked. For example, I really appreciated how this book demonstrated the evolution of female friendships over the years because as you're younger and you don't really have anything else going on in your life besides maybe school and your private life, you're very, very tight. But as you grow up and you, you know, you go off to have to leave, lead very different lives sometimes and your interests change and your life goals and values change, also your relationship changes. And that includes your female friendships. And I thought that was portrayed very realistically and in a very natural way in this book. And although this is a heist and there's also some romantic elements in here, I liked that the friendship was a very important element in this story. The story being set in China makes the reasons for these women to perform this heist very, very interesting because they struggle with things that is more specific, I would say, to their lives in Shanghai. Without giving anything away, I thought it was very interesting what kind of pressure these women were under. Also, there were very important discussions around the topics of responsibility and obligations towards your family, especially financial obligations and what it means to have to sacrifice your own dream to be there for other people. So the reasons why this book didn't quite work out for me and I gave it a three stars is because it, for one, it drags in the middle. It's quite a short book. It's only over 300 pages long and yet there was such a lull in there. And at first I couldn't put my finger on it, but I realized the actual heist, so the chapters that were taking place at the wedding, they were lacking comedic relief and they could have benefited from a much faster pace because they were just one task after the other in a very dry manner. Yeah, dry is probably a good word to describe how I felt about the heist part. And also in general, I think the book was just lacking some wittier and snappier dialogues. Overall, the idea was great, but maybe because this is a debut novel, I think there was just a bit of spark missing in there. It, it didn't feel very exciting to read. Obviously, this is just personal preference, so if the premise sounds good to you, I would still encourage you to pick this up and try it out. Next up, also with three stars, we have the second fourth wing book, which is Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros, and this is actually a very pretty edition. This is a new adult romanticy, so romance fantasy series. It's been everywhere on the internet, so you've probably heard of Fourth Wing before. I'm gonna give you the basic premise of the first book because this is the second and I don't wanna spoil anything that happens even in the first book. This book takes place at a war college called Basquiat, where we have young people being trained to become amongst a few different professions dragon riders. Our main character is Violet, she's your typical short woman 
who seems to be very fragile but then miraculously trains and becomes super strong. <laughs> Not only does she have to go through the very brutal training where a lot of cadets die, but she also finds out there's someone in the at the War College who wants her dead. There's where the enemies to lovers trope comes in. I'm doing this because it's not really animus, enemies to lovers. So the first book I gave four out of five stars. I had so much fun with that book. I couldn't put it down. I flew through it. Comparing that reading experience to reading the second one, it almost feels like I took off my heart-shaped sunglasses, you know, where you have them on and you see everything super rosy and nice. And then, but now with the second book, I feel like I took them off and now I'm seeing the series for what it is. <laughs> The world building for this fantasy series was one of the weakest points in the first book and I was really hoping that the author is gonna remedy that in the second book because these are, this is a long book. It's um, yeah, almost 600 pages, but no. The world building remains very, very questionable. There's still so many plot holes in here and I think what I put in my written review was it feels like the world building in the first book was as big as a Grand Canyon and then in the second book the author just threw a bunch of pebbles in there to try to fix it but obviously it's not working. I hoped that the author would have taken a step back, try to be not so ambitious with the fantasy part and maybe just focus on the romance. I was also talking to a real life friend about this book and she shared the opinion with me also that we lost a lot of steam in here when it comes to the romance part because that really carried i think the first book the spark was gone and it didn't help my reading experience smaller details that i overlooked in the first book really bothered me in this one one of them is it they keep describing how fragile violet is and i think it's some kind of autoimmune disease or something like that i don't quite understand why that was written in there unless it's a pure representation thing because it is nonsensical. Whenever Violet enters a fight or she, I don't know, falls down from somewhere, the injuries that she sustained would be also bad for a person who didn't suffer from fragility. They would be bad on anybody. If you had to um, enter a very, very tough combat and somebody knocks the shit out of you, you would be hurt. So I, it was, it's very superfluous that she suffers some kind of disease. It, I don't know, there's just so, <laughs> drink every time Violet gets nauseated. I have a lot of issues like that. What carried me through is really the dragons. I still love the dragons and I think that the friendships in here are also what is a strong point, especially since the romance got so weak in this book. What I don't appreciate is the author, she keeps on throwing characters in there where it's very clear they're just there to be killed off in the next chapter for a shock factor, but it doesn't help. I wish she would have just kept a core group of friends with Violet that we can really focus on instead of trying making the world so, so big character-wise as well. Same issues as the world building, essentially. The book ends on a major cliffhanger. To be honest, I don't care. I don't care at all. I care more about the revelation that has something to do with the dragons right before the ending. As you can hear, I'm a little torn. I'm honestly not sure if I should carry on with the series or not. Maybe I'm gonna do one last try with the third book and then if that doesn't work out, I'm just gonna drop it. If you're still debating if you wanna pick up Fourth Wing, I would still say go ahead, do it. It's so much fun. It's then up to you to decide if you wanna keep going with the series, but Fourth Wing for sure, a lot of fun. Moving on to four star territory, I read another Goosebumps. It's The Haunted School by R.L. Stein. This was from the tin that I got for Christmas. In this little story, we have middle schooler Tommy who transfers to a new school because he moves with his family. And this school seems a little odd because there's voices that he hears through the walls. And when he finds himself running around the school to find some art supplies, he figures out that there is something hidden behind the walls of the school, indeed. I think for a middle grade novella like this, this was a really interesting story. I had forgotten that I read this before. I didn't recognize the title. And there's actually a pretty scary Lord of the Flies moment in here. That's all I will say. It's very short. So I think this is one of the better Goosebumps stories. I gave it four stars. If you're in a quest to find good short middle grades, then definitely pick this up. And I'm definitely continuing my Goosebumps rereads. It's so much fun and such a throwback. Then I listened to Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zauner as audiobook. 
this memoir has been absolutely everywhere in the last years and it was time for me to read it. I didn't know Japanese Breakfast before reading this book, so Michelle Zonar is a singer in that band. A very good band by the way. I've started to listen to their music after reading this book. This is a very very personal memoir about grief. This is about Michelle Sonner being half Korean and upon losing her mother it she feels like she loses parts of her identity as well and a lot of her grief and of her memories are told to through the stories of food because food played a big big part in the relationship with her mother and this is how she feels connected to her Korean roots so there's a lot of descriptions about amazing food in here but it does feel extremely personal. It felt to me like listening to a diary and almost too genuine for me to criticize because I felt like I was listening to a friend tell me her story. It's interesting because there were a few elements in here that I was able to relate to being brought up also in an Asian household. A good example would be the biannual visits to Korea. We used to do that when I was little. We would every other year visit the Philippines to see my extended family. This was really a fantastic, vulnerable read. I didn't give this quite the best rating because there was just the little something for me missing that would have pushed this over to a perfect five stars. It is overall a very well told and very honest story and I think it definitely deserves the hype that it gets. Next up, with 4.5 out of 5 stars, I read The Mystery Guest by Nita Prose. I was so, so looking forward to this book because as you probably know, I loved The Maid, which is the debut novel by Nita Prose, and technically it is the first book in the series, but you can apparently read this as a standalone. I'm just gonna say it's more fun if you read The Maid first. This story once again takes place at the Grand Regency Hotel, a beautiful hotel where Molly works as a maid. She's our main character who is super fierce, super smart. She is neurodiverse and she once again finds herself in the middle of a murder investigation. I was instantly so smitten with Molly. This is a very voicey narration I would say. The voice, the writing is a particular flavor. If you don't like the first one you probably would like this one. This is not a spoiler. Even in the first book we learned that Molly's grandma, her closest closest family member has passed away and Molly is dealing with living on her own. Now what I really liked was that grandma becomes a very important character in this book and we learn so much more about her past and even Molly's past. Molly's working a regular shift at the hotel. She's supposed to help out with a luncheon that is led by Grimthorpe, who is a very, very prominent murder mystery writer, when he drops dead on stage. So the detective from the first book is back and once again she's trying to figure out what has happened and Molly is somehow kind of involved in this. And true to a murder mystery story, the story unfolds in a very satisfying way. This is not a thriller where you have like so many revelations that come out of nowhere. This is a mystery where the reader can piece together the story up to maybe 90% and then in the end you get the cherry on top which is the final reveal but you are able to follow the mystery and look at the clues with alongside the characters which is I think what is the biggest difference between a murder, classic murder mystery and something like a domestic thriller or psychological thriller. And I'm only now with the second book realizing why I loved both of these books so much. It's because they both feature one of my most favorite tropes which is a woman breaking out of their shell. I absolutely enjoyed this. I loved it. The first book was a four stars. This is a 4.5 and I'm hoping the next book is going to be a five stars. So this is a book that I'm going to expect to be put on my year end favorites already because I loved it so much. And then the next book, so this is my five star read for January. This is for sure going to make it to my favorite list of the year. I know it's only January, but still. It's Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong. I don't know why I was so surprised. I've seen so many people love this, but I think that also the whole discussion around this book is extremely, extremely interesting. But for me, this just completely worked. This is an outrageous story about a white female author. Her name is June. So she has a frenemy called Athena Liu. Athena is a best-selling author. She is Asian and she's basically extremely successful and everything that Jane wants to be. Now, under very odd circumstances, Athena passes away in the presence 
of Jane and Jane finds a manuscript that Athena was working on that nobody else has seen yet and she decides to take that manuscript and pretend like she wrote it. Now the thing is the book is about Chinese laborers during the first world war and the publisher thinks it's a much better idea if they publish this book under a racially ambiguous name because June is a white woman. And they think that it would suit the book much better if she publishes under Juniper's song, which definitely could sound like an Asian name. So that is the setup. I will say that I listened to this as an audiobook and I need to say that the audiobook is fantastic. The narrator is so, so snarky. It definitely suits the tone of the book. The audiobook is narrated by Helen Laser, and she did a fantastic job. June seems to be the definition of being Delulu. She's so delusional, she is so so incredibly ignorant. Reading this book is a whole experience. It is told from June's point of view, so she is absolutely an unreliable narrator. For a big part of the book, she's basically trying to convince herself that what she did was okay and she does not think that she is racist, but she obviously is. She thinks that she deserves all of the fame that comes to her. The most infuriating thing is that there's so many people around her in this publishing industry that side with her, that help her out. The structural racism in this book is insane and the microaggressions, oh my God. As an Asian myself, obviously I've, I've lived this, I know this and the prose is so addictive. It is written so, so well in a way that you cannot put it down. This is definitely a book that at some point I want to reread with a physical copy because I only listened to it. And am I the only one who kept picturing Athena Lu as Gemma Chan, who I saw in Crazy Rich Asians? I think she would make the perfect actress to portray her. So that is all the books that I read in January. Let me know what you think. Did you read any of these books? Now, by using my library card, I saved $47.99 pre-tax. Don't forget to let me know what your favorite read in January was. Have you already found your first five stars? And if you just want to maybe let me know that you're still watching and you don't have anything else to comment, why don't you leave me some kind of yellow emoji for yellow face, obviously. Thank you so, so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.